Gracious Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for the access that you've given us to boldly, with confidence, approach that throne of grace. Thankful for the opportunity, the privilege that we have to feast upon your word, to study it, to meditate on it. I ask that you would filter out all of that which is not of you, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth and only truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve again at blessedhopeforever.com, and we're rapidly approaching the end of this marvelous study that we've been involved in in the book of Revelation verse by verse, sometimes section by section, sometimes chapter by chapter. And in, I believe in my last video we were talking about, we're looking at the new heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, which followed the great white throne judgment. Now there are many commentators such as myself that suggest that when we're looking at this holy city, this heavenly city, New Jerusalem here, that the first eight verses of chapter 21 is the city in the eternal state, whereas verse 9, uh, beginning at verse 9, it, it goes on and it describes its relationship to the millennium, the kingdom age, the thousand year reign of Christ on earth. And there's a lot of debate uh, back and forth on that. I, I believe that in looking at this, we can see uh, if we really slow down and we look at the language that the Holy Spirit uses in, its, uh, in his description of its occupants and their relationship to the city as compared to uh, uh, those saints uh, who enter into the kingdom age to populate it. That I think the either or argument of, you know, whether this uh, we're looking at uh, here in 22, if we're looking at the uh, the heavenly city, is, is this during the millennium or is this during the eternal state which follows the millennium? I think that very argument uh, of, well, which is it, you know, uh, what are we looking at? The millennium, the thousand year reign or the eternal state? I think it fails to consider that the relationship of the city's occupants, which will be, as I mentioned, uh, the church age saints, the resurrected Old Testament saints at the second coming, the tribulation saints, as well as the unfallen angels, and of course our Lord himself, the occupants will remain unchanged after the end of the millennial age. In other words, the millennial age comes to an end. Uh, the universe transitions to that state of, of that eternal state where that there's a new heaven and a single new heaven and a new earth. But our relationship to the city, I guess my point is, here is that our relationship to the city will remain unchanged despite that transition that convulgence, that, that purge, if you want to call it, or that uh, all of the elements melt with fervent heat and the eternal state begins. Our relationship remains unchanged. I'd like to uh, begin here looking at, at chapter 22 in verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And the Lamb. And of the Lamb. God and of the Lamb. One throne with both God and the Lamb mentioned. Now that adjective pure uh, there, in, you know, well, it must be omitted because it is not found in the best manuscripts. 
the uh, I don't know how it managed to wiggle its way into the text, but it's not there in the most reliable manuscripts. The river is full of water, and that water, we know that that water is the emblem of life. It's the, it's the beautiful symbol of life. You know, we can, uh, you know, we can go many days without eating, but we can't go very long without water or we'll die. Life, you know, and everybody, pretty much everybody knows that our bodies are made up of a great percent of water. Uh, so it's, it's the beautiful symbol of life in its completeness. I want to say here, right here at the outset, that uh, it, despite what it might seem like, that well, you know, we've come to this beautiful picture at the end of, of this amazing book of where God's judgment, uh, His wrath was poured out on evil. That uh, this is God's ju justice. Uh, not vengeance, but justice. Not vengeance in the sense that, that we tend, tend to use that word vengeance. But justice. Just as it was just that God justify us, make, made us righteous, bestow His righteousness upon us because our ju judgment fell on Christ. It's a beautiful picture, yet despite its beauty and despite its wonder, all its many wonders, as we read through the text, and I mean, this is, we're looking at here, folks, what we've so longed for, so what we so long for every day of our lives, we live in expectation of such wonders, and yet... I've got to let you know at the beginning of this, I think it's only fair that I point out the fact that much of what is written, much of what is given us here is clouded in obscurity. I find it interesting that God really doesn't have a whole lot to say about the eternal state, which is interesting. Uh, it seems to stop at that point. When we reach the point of the eternal state, God doesn't have a whole lot left to say. And maybe it's because our minds can't possibly conceive of, of such wonders that await us. The Garden of Eden, as we know in Genesis chapter 2, it had its river. Even in the wilderness, Israel had uh, water from that the smitten rock. You know, it gushed out like a river. We read about that in Psalms 105. The prophet Joel, he saw a fountain out of the house of the Lord. You can read about that in Joel chapter 3. Zechariah, he spoke of living waters from Jerusalem in the 14th chapter of Zechariah. It was Ezekiel who had the fullest vision when he beheld the stream which deepened and broadened in its onward progress from under the, the, the threshold of the house of God and carried life, that water carried life with it. Everything lived wherever the water flowed. That's Ezekiel chapter 47. The prophets, they spoke of the river of God's pleasures in Psalms 36. And uh, in the bestowal of the Holy Spirit, Christ satisfied our thirst. You read about that in John chapter 4. And you read about that also again in John chapter 7. The source of the river is the throne of God. 
Now, as in a, if you go back and you look at Ezekiel, Ezekiel's uh, vision, his river th- that he described, it took rise in the temple. But in John's vision, there is no temple. Uh, chapter 21 here in our study, Revelation 21, 22. It's uh, we could spend a whole lot of time, folks, on just that one word water. We know that we were cleansed, we are clean, continually cleansed by through the Word of God, that water represents the Word of God. Whereas the oil represents the Holy Spirit, water represents uh, life and and abundant life, not just life in the sense of the an extension of life. Uh, the the how would you say it? The extent, the degree, the extent of of life, but but quality, a, a quality of life. It's important to note here also that it it is the throne of God. It's the throne, not thrones, but one throne of God and of the Lamb. The God-man, Jesus Christ, or if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. No man has seen the Father at any time. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So we have a God-man sitting on the throne, and that is the place from which the source from which this water this river flows this water of life it's i'll admit it's difficult to draw if i was the best artist in the world which you know i'm not but if i was the if i was a michelangelo or a da vinci or somebody i could not draw a picture adequate enough to describe the words that we're looking at here in this text. What I find really interesting about this is that in verse 2, in the midst of the street of it, in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, says the text, which, which which bear twelve manners of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and that is quite a mouthful. You could spend a whole lot of time, and this is why this is why I mentioned meditating on his word, not just studying his word, but spending time meditating on his word, because there's so much there to try to wrap our mind around. So the hunger as well as the thirst of the Spirit is to be satisfied. Uh, You know, I've had people ask me, Steve, will we we eat or drink in heaven? Will we sleep in heaven? And I've even had people say, you know, know, are we going to have a digestive system, you know, and will our new bodies have some sort of digestive system? We can let our minds wander about such silly questions all day long, but the fact of the matter is is that when all is said and done and we leave this world and we are forever with our Lord, we will not cease to either, in my opinion, desire or, or need that sustenance, that refreshment, that nourishment from God, both in the sense of drinking as well as eating. And and I'm I'm just so afraid and I and I have been. I've it's been on my mind for the past twenty four hours. I'm just so afraid I'm not going to do justice to the verses that we're looking at here. But I hope to do my best. 
the tree of life, as well as the river of life, is going to be seen in this new Eden, if you want to call it that. And uh, the vision of Ezekiel actually parallels this verse. On the border of the river, there was very much wood. On both sides, every kind of tree, its leaf withers not and its fruit ceases not. And all months does it ripen. Its fruit serves for food and its leaves for healing. That's in the 47th chapter of Ezekiel. It's almost a parallel uh, passage to the passage that we're looking at here. Now, what's interesting about the, the words, the leaves were for the healing of the nations. The word there in the original text is therapeutic. Therapy. It's a, it's a, you know, many people take uh, vitamins, they'll take uh, supplements, they'll take, you know, uh, that which is therapeutic, which is, is it, it, it's not, they don't do that because they're sick. I don't think that we can read into this text that the nations are sick, and, and, and I don't know, it sounds like that in the English is for the healing of the nations as if the nations are sick and somehow they need healing. The word is where we get our word therapeutic. The nations are not sick. They just need therapy. Now, uh, this is another evidence, I believe, for this being the millennium, not the eternal state. I mean, just consider what these nations went through the past seven years. Twelve manner of fruit. Twelve. Now, you know, many of you, you've heard me mention twelve on numerous occasions that it, it, it has, twelve represents uh, it, uh, God's, it's symbolic of God's power and authority. Twelve is, is in the foundations and the gates of the city, twelve disciples, and, you know, twelve, so on and so forth, so forth. It represents God's authority and power. So we have variety Okay, in relationship with unity here, 12 manners of fruits. Different seasonable fruits. Well, Steve, is there going to be seasons in heaven? Folks, I don't know. It's, it's the same with the word months. Now, I don't have as much problem with the word months as in the sense that because eternity and there's another evidence for this being the millennium, not the eternal state, because uh, eternity, eternity is 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 timelessness. Okay, uh, but it, and so the text says twelve manner of fruit, twelve. Okay, representing God's authority and a variety. Okay of fruits now you I, I suppose you could you could argue you could say well the it bears 12 manners of fruit so every month it's bearing a different type of fruit or you could say that it bears all 12 manners of fruits every month you could do that too and this is what i mean about these passages being a little obscure and and it's i'll admit it they're a little tough you know to to try to meditate through but meditate we must. And I think there's a great benefit in doing that. If we spend, and perhaps that's the whole reason why they're obscure, that God wants us to take and not just study his word, but meditate on it. Who knows what uh, thoughts are going to come into our minds that the Lord himself may place there. The Holy Spirit may. He's our teacher. So we need to meditate on these verses. And if someone else has a different view, you know, it's inconsistent with our own it's not in agreement with our own it's it's that's it's no big deal if you want to look at that as 12 manners of fruit it produces a different type of fruit every month or if you want to say it produces all 12 every month you know we can still be friends but i want you to notice that and this i believe this is important different seasonable fruits but 
one tree. One tree. And I've I've seen pictures, folks, of of this artists have tried to to paint this, draw this thing as as though you know you've got this river and you've got these uh, a street on both sides and you've got on on, on the streets uh, that are on each side of the river you've got trees, you know, just all along the street. It says one tree. One tree. Now I'm I'm a big fan of taking God at His word. He says one tree. He doesn't say that both sides of this is lined with trees. He says one tree. And that tree, in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, it's got to be huge. This one tree. Because, and why do I say that? Because it's accessible from both sides of the river. But, Steve, I thought you said there weren't, there's only one street, so how can there be, a, and this is what I'm driving at here, and I don't ask anybody to agree with me, but this is the image, the, the picture that, that, I, that I see in my head when I read this, when I consider everything that's said, and I take it literally, it, it's in the midst of of the one main street, you know, you know what a main street is. We've got one in our little town, just not far from here, seven miles. We live in the country, but seven miles away, there's a small town, a little small Oklahoma town, and it's got a main street. Of course, most main streets nowadays are, are well, they're not as, they're not like they were back when I was a kid. Uh, they're not as quite the busy places that they used to be, but but everybody knows what a main street is. And just about every t little town has a main street. It says, in the midst of the one, one main street of it, and on either side of the river, that's both sides of the river, was there the singular tree of life. One main street one access to God, that's important, I believe. One river, in other words, one source of life, that's important. One drink, one tree, one source of food, okay? One God. And folks, I believe that the river flows through the tree. That's what I believe. And I don't ask anybody to agree with me, but I believe, I, you know, and I've seen pictures of trees, you know, where it's, uh, you know, I think there's one in California, you drive through it or something. I, I just picture this tree as, I don't know how to say, except just say it's got a hole in it. And, the, and the, you know, the river runs through it. So the river runs through the tree. And the tree is on both sides of the one main street. That's what the text is telling me. Now, I could be wrong, but that's what it, it appears to be to me. I think the river flows through the tree. It doesn't say two trees with a row of trees along both streets. That's the wrong picture. That's not the picture I see. And don't miss seeing where the tree itself gets its nourishment. The tree itself gets its nourishment from the throne of God and the lamb in other words god waters the tree that bears the fruit that we eat and guess what the same is true today is it not he's the vine where the branches of course that's a subject that that's seldom brought up for most pulpits today because, you know, modern Christianity, and with, with for all it's worth, it wants us to believe that we're the vine. That we ought, it, does, it fails to, to realize that all righteousness is of the Lord, that we can somehow produce righteousness on our own, that, uh, you know, uh, we don't really need to abide in Him so that, you know, we can produce fruit, he being the vine, we being the branches. We could pretty much just do that on our own. And that, it, 
as well is not the right picture. Okay. The right picture is, is that unless we die to the law, we cannot bear fruit unto God. So God feeds his people with food convenient for them. Uh, we read about that in Proverbs chapter 30. If you turn to Proverbs chapter 30, you'll read that he feeds his people with food convenient for them. Except there is but one food for all. John 6.31 You cannot, it's almost impossible for me to take and read through this, to study through this, to meditate through this, and not see that the mind of the Holy Spirit in which he's trying to convey his thoughts, or he is conveying his thoughts, the thoughts the thought that the Holy Spirit is trying to convey here, the picture that he's trying to draw, the description that he's trying to give us, its focus is on things that are much more greater, much greater in importance than just the beauty that the, the, the natural eye tends to behold. Will it be beautiful? Well, of course it will be. But I think what is difficult for us to, to take and wrap our minds around, it's, it's, it's almost impossible for me to separate doctrine from this, just as I've said before. Uh, if we look at Proverbs... Go to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 18. It says that, that wisdom is not the mere knowledge of things, but uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, which has no place here. We know that doesn't, that's that, that tree that they are, first parents Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good which gave them the knowledge of good and evil we certainly don't see it here uh, they ate of that we know what happened when they did and we also know that it's uh, that this tree of life here is comparable to that tree of life that Adam ate from before he sinned which he was forbidden to eat from after he sinned, which if he had eaten of it, you talk about grace here. If he had, if God had allowed him to eat of it after he had fell, he would have lived forever in a fallen state. So our text goes on and says, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. I can't say if that's referring to us or or to, or to Israel or the, you know the Old Testament saints. I believe it's uh, at that point it could be that we're all considered servants, even though Jesus said, "I don't consider you servants, but friends." But there could be some dispensational distinction there to, for you to think about. And there shall be no more curse. It's better better to say that I believe that every curse or every, or every accursed thing shall be gone. There may be uh, an allusion to uh, the seventh chapter of Joshua. There's certainly certainly a borrowing of language from Zechariah. All accursed things are removed, and with them passes the curse. There's no more curse. The blessing of God's presence and the blessing of God's rule take the place of evil over this, uh, this uh, groaning creation. And keep in mind that this the creation itself won't be delivered at its second coming it will only be, be delivered 
the creation itself, when the new heavens and new earth are uh, come into existence after the thousand years. The throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They're described as serving him. They're described as seeing him. And they are described as resembling him. You know, the, the, here where we're at now in this life, our whole desire, intention, and purpose should be to, to be uh, to have that comfort of knowing that we are becoming more and more like Christ. Uh, our inner man, our new man is perfectly righteous. The old flesh, it profits nothing. We are becoming more and more like him uh, day to day. Though our outward man is perishing, our inward man is being renewed day by day. We know this from previous studies. They shall serve him. The, 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 the service of the priesthood, this is one reason why I tend to lean toward the dispensational view of this. But even though we are priests as well, the word is that used of temple service. So I guess, I suppose uh, you can throw out the dispensational thing, whether whether we're all one in Christ, even though these are old, there are Old Testament saints there with us in that heavenly city who were never members of the body of Christ. We will all serve him. And it doesn't have a temple. As, as was, was true in, in, the, in the former dispensation, you know, before the dispensation of grace. The word translated servants is, uh, is the word which the apostles used when they spoke of themselves as slaves of Jesus Christ. That's, we, we're bond slaves. He owns us. That's, we're, you know, owned. He, we were bought with a price, so owned as well as employed by him. Uh, and in this life, well, many of you know better than, than some of us, I'm sure, uh, God takes us down our, 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 each one of us down our own path, but our service in this, this life is full of discouragements, hardships, difficulties, trials, temptations. We walk by faith, not by sight, but now these servants serve without, without any of that. They, they serve him without hindrance. They serve him without opposition. All of that is gone. No sin nature. And they shall see his face. They shall know, even as they are known, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I believe. There will come a time where that we will be like him because we will and I'm talking about fully, completely, entirely like him because, and I love that word because in the text, we will see him as he is. Think about that, folks. All it will take for us to become completely like him is to behold him, to see him, which we do now in part. And they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads. In their foreheads, might your text might read, I don't know what translation you're using, his name shall be in or on, upon their foreheads. The word in the Greek there is upon. The name upon their foreheads indicates their resemblance to him. On earth, we, we, were, we were changed from glory to glory into the same image. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, that's true right now, but when we see God as He is, we will be like Him. Those who are, who are like God see Him, and those who see Him are like Him. There's something magical, mystical, I don't know how, you know, uh, supernatural. There's something really interesting about 
about others seeing Christ in us, not ourselves, not our old, ugly, rotten, sinful selves. That's what we want. We want others to see Christ in us. We don't want them. The focus is never on ourselves. It's not about us. We want others to see Christ in us. Uh, so there will come a time when the service of God will, will be in our simply beholding Him. So we behold Him as we look in this book, we study this book, we, we meditate on it, we pray about it, we, we spend time. What a marvelous privilege we have to spend time in this book. Because when we do, it's not just propositional revelation that's entering into our brain. It's not just about gaining knowledge. It's not, it's not about accumulating knowledge about Him as much as it is, you know, you can, you can fill your head full of propositional information, okay? It doesn't do you a, a lick of good if it's not, if you're not seeing Him. You know, you can spend your whole life, folks, studying this book and miss seeing Jesus Christ for who He is and what He's done in your life. So spend time in this book. There will come a time when our service toward God will be in our simply beholding Him. Our beholding Him will be our service. And there shall be no night. No night. I've known Christians who, who love the darkness. They love the night. They love the candlelight. They love the, you know... Twice is it said that all darkness shall cease. Darkness, folks, has to flee from where he is, from where God is. They can't both exist. Light, light and darkness can't exist in, this, in the same place at the same moment. The same, you know. Right now, we are children of light, but we walk in a dark place but at this time all that darkness will cease darkness will have to flee because of him from where he is it'll be dispelled when god gives us shows us this light which is his glory we behold his glory he prayed that we would be with him where he was and behold his glory. Same is true today. You know, no artificial light is needed in this place that we're going to. I, I and I, folks, I hate anything artificial. I do. I, you can ask Sue. Right? Anything artificial, artificial flowers, artificial flavorings, artificial. I just hate. I hate the the word artificial. Artificial Christianity. No, no artificial light. No other source of light is needed. Why? Because he who is light is their light. Those who were children of light now dwell in the light of God and they reign with him. Were made kings and priests to God. That was, we saw that in the first chapter of Revelation. And we reign with him, not for a thousand years, we reign with Him forever. Forever. This is what we have to look forward to. And with that, with this utterance, the visions, for the most part, of Revelation close. The saints of God have been seen 
in the bitterness of their struggle, in their journey toward this magnificent, eternal home. And they've made progress. They've gone from strength to strength. No good thing's been withheld. Light, God gives us light. He gives us love. He gives us life. It's ours. Light, love, is a, they're ours. But it's been only a foretaste of what is to come. Only a foretaste. So all things considered, just in these uh, few verses here, the first five verses of chapter 22, we are looking at, I believe, what, a, a fullness or a completeness of what we have now received in part. The only true source of living water being God, the Holy Spirit and His Word, His divine nature, our new nature, our sinless new nature, uh, the, the continual, the unceasing manner in which the new man bears fruit, whether, whether you think it does or not, it does. Please, dearly beloved. Believe God when he says it does. And the source of that being Christ, the true vine, bond servants of God. We can, we can be nothing else. He owns us. He bought us with a price. But you've got a main street leading to the throne of God, one access we have that now in a temporal sense, but an access nevertheless to boldly approach the throne of grace. Complete access to the God-man Jesus Christ who intercedes on our behalf, his name written now in our hearts, but soon to be written upon our forehead. Bond slaves, bond slaves showing full ownership because he bought us with a prize. We belong to him. We have even now passed out of darkness into light. We know that in him is no darkness at all, only light. Light gives us direction. It lights our path. In Him is no darkness at all. Only light. Light gives us direction. And what do you think that is? That's, that's, if we don't spend time, folks, in this book, we don't have much direction. This is the light that we have today. The glory of God manifests through the person and the work of Jesus Christ. This book, who's, who's, I've mentioned this before. I've, I've, I don't know, I've probably said it a thousand times. It's not a book of instructions on how to live the Christian life. It is primarily a revelation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. I pray, dearly beloved, that you see that. We come to this book to see our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's where our affections are. Our affection is everything is drawn toward Jesus Christ. Even if you believe that that is true, well, Steve, that's only true in my life in a sort of a superficial way. Most of the time, God seems distant and blah, 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 and on and on you go. <coughs> I'm sorry. You don't quite understand how God's working in your life. Even during the darkest times, 
when you think that God is not there and that He's distant. He's there, working in you both the will and to do of His good pleasure. Take comfort, dearly beloved. Take comfort in that. He guides, He directs us even now in our journey toward this place that we're looking at which is not as much described in terms of beauty that, that, you know, that the eye beholds. Even though that place is no doubt beautiful, we can see from the description that, that the place is magnificently indescribable. But the real beauty to behold here, which I don't want you to miss, which we will behold, is the face of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ or that everything else will pale in comparison. That's why no man can possibly, in my opinion, do justice in describing what we are seeing here except our Lord Himself who gave us these words. We started out looking at the grace of God toward the seven churches, and we see in this final chapter, the opening of this final chapter, we see the curtain drawn back to, to a, reveal a picture where that we are given a glimpse of the results of that amazing grace in our lives. I love you all. I truly do. Uh, I pray that all of you are well and that the Lord is upholding you and sustaining you through whatever difficulties or trials that you're going through. Know that... Uh, that I'm praying for you constantly. And I ask for your prayers concerning the direction of this ministry. Thank you for all of your kind messages of love and support. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.